I'm going to have to work two apparatuses, apparati here, so we'll see how bad I can mess it up. Um, I'll come to in a minute why we would look in this part of the Gulf of Mexico as opposed to anywhere else on the on the hemisphere, really, for the initial people into the United of, of the New World. Um, in part, there's sort of three um, competing hypotheses that seem to be fairly viable at this point. However contentious they are, and I'll grant you that, um, the others seem to be, other potential hypotheses aren't necessarily as good. But whether people come to the New World across the Bering Land Bridge, along the Northern Pacific, either island hopping and, or coastal hopping using boats, or potentially doing the same sort of thing across the North Atlantic, wherever that initial point of entry into the New World is, it's underwater. And if you're not looking around there, you're never going to find it. And in part, we hope to not only push back the age of the archaeological record in the New World, but as we get closer to those coasts that are further distant from even the potentially pre clovis sites in Florida, Virginia, Pennsylvania, there's one that Adivazio had up there you probably have heard of, um, the things in Oregon and such as that, none of them are going to have anything to do with that initial point of entry that Whatever, wherever the people came from in the Pleistocene, uh, we've not looked at that edge yet. And so um, this part of the Gulf it not, is not necessarily where we think the initial point of entry into the New World is. However, there's a real interesting analogy to be drawn from Australia. Australia has coastal sites that essentially circumnavigate the, sub, the continent and it takes about 10,000 years for them to basically dot the entire coast then there's an interior site. And I don't mean to necessarily suggest that we're going to push back the people into the New World by 10,000 years, but I suspect it'll be more than 50 years or 100 years, you know, maybe on the order of a few hundred years or a thousand or a couple thousand even. But, but the point is, it's going to get older and we would expect as the, things get, as the sites get older, the behavior exhibited at these sites should become less familiar to what we consider to be Paleo-Indian in the New World. So sort of keeping that grand idea in mind, the reason then to look in the, Gulf, the Northeast Gulf of Mexico is what I call the Goldilocks hypothesis. It's just right. Um, you can see to the west of Florida where, the, where I was saying that um, the Mississippi is starting, it, you can actually see it filling in the outer continental shelf. And this, this line here is the intercontinental shelf. This, would have been ex this whole part of Florida would have been land at, depending on whose data you agree with, between 26 and 22,000 years ago. So that's the potential area of colonization. Um, as we get farther out on that edge, we suspect there's a l less likelihood of finding any signature, even of, of the plants and animals living on that landscape at that time. But of course, the human signature becomes even more and more ephemeral. Um, but the reason to look out there is in part by some work that uh, Jim Dunbar and, and others have been doing, at least since the 60s, probably even into the 50s, you could legitimately argue. Um, the concentration of Paleo-Indian artifacts and Pleistocene faunal remains, or terminal Pleistocene faunal remains in Florida, are basically from where we're standing right here up through about the St. Mark's River, you know, just south of Tallahassee. Well, immediately offshore of that, obviously we all know it's very flat, very low energy regime in terms of um, sediment load. And in fact, it's char generally characterized as a sand-starved uh, intercontinental shelf. So we have an area that is immediately adjacent to a, a lot of early Paleo-Indian material. Unlike the Mississippi, it's not so deeply buried that we're never going to be able to get to it. And in the preserved rivers and karst features like sinkholes and other solution features that we've now seen, we have 2, 000, over 2,000 target loci that we've generated in the last two years of field work. Um, uh, Essentially, then, that's where I sort of made up the, the Goldilocks hypothesis. It's not so deeply buried, we'll never see it, but it's not eroded, and it's actually kind of protected by the Florida middle grounds in particular, um, which probably remained uh, barrier islands off the coast of Florida until maybe eight or 9,000 years ago. So it, um, this year, we really focused on uh, following the Swanee out and following the Paleo Swanee. But, um, 
that river system would have had the, bar the big barrier islands outside of it essentially acting as protection until the sea level transgression just swallows it all up. And in fact, it, they would have had that protection until long after they'd been inundated, probably on the order of three or 4,000 years. Um, here's just a couple of examples of some of the things that you know, come from Florida. The Wakala Point is B that has the potential to be contemporaneous with Clovis, maybe even earlier. The Page Ladson points, I think a, a fairly compelling case can be made that they're on the order of three to 500 years older than the Clovis material that we're more familiar with. Um, the A is one of the little Cactus Hill points from Virginia that, uh, depending on context, could be anywhere between 13 and maybe as much as 17 or 18,000 years old. So there's tantalizing hints on the inland sites of things earlier than Clovis, but uh, getting to them is an entirely different issue. This is actually our best guess uh, of where the Swanee went, and it turns out it's, a it's pretty close. We actually guessed right um, based on looking at bathymetric maps where it went, but um, it, it moved considerably different than this. And when, we, when I get to the end and I'm talking about what we did this year, I'll, I'll bring that up a little bit more. But, but um, in 2008, we uh, took out um, the, the RV Sun Coaster from the University of South Florida's, uh, the Institute of, um, Flor the Florida Institute of Oceanography, which is here in St. Pete at the um, USF campus. And we basically decided to use side scan sonar and a sub-bottom profiler to look at three different areas. Oops. Um, just east of the Florida middle grounds, um, an area west of the middle grounds, and then in the Steamboat Lumps uh, National Marine Sanctuary, we uh, looked at another, another sort of um, uh, a group of essentially ba a top topographic features that were visible on the bathymetric maps. Because what we were looking for were things that could be uh, sea level stands or shorelines and anything that might have been a river system. And so what we saw in area one to the east of the middle grounds is actually right below there where we actually see where the Suwannee comes out. And we've documented that pretty well now. Um, out here we were looking at what looked to be a big lagoon and, and obviously it's greatly exaggerating how big the area is. We're talking about you know a 20 kilometer seg segment there and about an 8 or 10 kilometer segment here, a little box that we looked at and stuff. We'll move along to some of the um, equipment that we've used which is not in your typical dig kit. Uh, <laughs> This is a side scan sonar towfish. It essentially looks like a torpedo. The case is about seven feet long, and it, I don't think I could lift it by myself. It's a, a real pain in the butt. But it, it does a, a very nice job of mapping the surface of the seafloor. It essentially sh shoots out um, an elec it, the, the electronic signal that comes back to you shows essentially the black line down the middle is the shadow from the boat, or, or actually it's a shadow from the towfish. It's actually on a cable several hundred feet behind the boat. Um, what you're looking at here is in that area east of the middle grounds is a, is a step that's probably on the order of three or four meters. And it's probably sand, but it's sand sitting up on top of something else. And so I think we're actually looking at a surficially visible segment of an inundated river. Um, because we were running the side scan sonar, which maps the surface, and the um, sub-bottom profiler, which essentially cuts an electronic backhoe trench that you'd see right down the middle of the, of the image. Um, uh, traditionally, that's how people would do these kind of projects, usually for oil or pipelines or military applications. And there's a, a unbelievable array of homeland security things that we keep running into folks that we have uh, uh, very similar interests with different objectives, obviously. But, um, I'll, I'll finish with uh, why my whole project's essentially antiquated, but it's, it's, it's <laughs> beyond the pale for anything archaeologists have ever done, but uh, we're a generation of technology behind already. Um, this is one of the more interesting things that we found in 2008. We found these giant ripples. These are you know, on the order of meters wide and a couple of meters at least tall. Uh, you can get things like that in, in deep water gyres, but they're all oriented along, this is actually right north-south. Um, they're essentially oriented on what would have been the Paleo shoreline. These seem to be just in, we were just inside the late glacial maximum shoreline. These are in about 
330 feet of water, and they probably were formed in about 30 feet of water. Um, again, having uh, the, the, as I was discussing about the Florida Middle Grounds as barrier islands serving as a good protecting area, it just happens that this whole section of the intercontinental shelf of Florida is pretty well out of harm's way in terms of hurricanes and, in, and even the, uh, the Gulf of Mexico uh, gyre. So when we have the side scan sonar running, you can see that we're generating, that's only one half of the image, but what I was trying to show here is the, um, the trackways of uh, port and starboard. You can see the boats heading to, or the ship is point headed to the northeast. We're just about to come to the end of a transect. We shut the machine off, make our turn, and, you know, shut it off for just a few seconds, turn it back on, make sure it's still working when we start our last transect in this area. Um, the red dots are our, our targets where we've seen something of interest. And when I say of interest in the surface, it means sometimes just a circular depression where you actually see something that could be a sinkhole to we've actually seen honest to goodness ship um, uh, sinkholes. This year we saw uh, two shipwrecks, one of which is uh, plotted and one apparently not. And we found something else this year, which um, we're not sure if we should be happy or worried, but uh, we found cargo containers. <laughs> so that'll be a different dive trip. <laughs> um, because we're using or separate systems, we had the, the towfish for um, the side scan sonar. And you can see this long black thing on one side, and there's the other sensor that, that the paired sensors you know, basically it sits off the back of the boat and creates that image that I showed you before that, that looks like fairly droll uh, brown oh. stuff. This is the sub-bottom profiler and um, that basically goes right down the middle of that line and because we're using the ship's navigational equipment and constantly geo-referencing where we are and where the towfish is in relation to where the boat is, we know where our images are coming from. So we can go back and mosaic them and put them together. Um, this year we used a combined system and we'll get into a little more discussion of what a thing of beauty that is. But um, there's the, uh, <laughs> the, the prisoner lashed to the deck before going in. And n n one thing that absolutely doubled our effective work time was by using a combined system th this year. Uh, instead of rerunning the same transects, we, we, we got all of our information at once and it's already sync together so we know what the surface of the seafloor looks like immediately adjacent to those places that um, we want to um, see what the um, the buried strata look like and this is this is a couple of examples of um, a, a faint hint of something uh, decidedly unnatural in there well I mean natural but um, decidedly unlike just regular seafloor Last year, I think the most we saw in any of our trend, or any of our images on the sub-bottom profiler, um, we probably saw something on the order of like three, maybe five or six distinct layers of strata. This year, we saw a couple of places where we know we are in the Paleo Swanee, and we had as many as 17, 18 layers of strata. In one area, and I, I don't have an image of this, unfortunately, um, but we have a, sink, a, a pretty clear sinkhole, and in an area about a third of the way up it, um, on a little terrace, there's the unbelievably jet black lines that look like a pile of bones sitting there. So uh, the trick is we can get about a meter or so through by hand fanning and digging and such, but we really need to go back with a dredge. And that's the next generation, but we'll come to that again. Um, some of these other second line, hard, harder returns that can be just uh, old landscape features. It's something other than the modern seafloor and the biomantle that sits on top of it, which can either be tube worms or um, coral we've discovered and we can actually in some instances tell the difference from our side scan sonar data. We actually can recognize the difference. So again coming back to where, where we've been working in 2008 and, and what we managed to accomplish. We originally were going out with a 14 day cruise because of uh, problems with our winch, problems and its installation and, and, and some other issues with the other equipment because of weather and some issues with uh, uh, trading out the captains. And then, of course, our boat died last year. It has uh, two giant propellers on the two motors and the shaft, a 20-foot long or 18-foot long piece of stainless steel, this, the, the rubber gasket that protects it started on fire. So 
um, when you're about 120 miles offshore and we're about here and our boat's on, not fire, but it's trying to be on fire, we came right back here. <laughs> Which, so effectively, we work 24 hours a day when we're out there. And so a 14 day uh, field season effectively became six days of 24 hour work. Uh, this year, we got our full 14 days. We had almost no gear problems, with one notable exception, and I'll come to at the end. Um, I'm pretty certain that no matter where you've worked, you never had to stop working because you had 40 dolphins attacking your towfish. <laughs> it, it's a new hazard to archaeology. It's, uh, now, those Homeland Security guys probably have had similar things, but. They didn't really bring it up. Well, so where we were going into this field season, we, we knew some folks in 2005 had managed to map about 20 kilometers of the offshore, uh, of the Paleo Swanee Channel offshore of the modern mouth. And uh, um, we wanted to really find out what river are we looking at here? And it really was running pretty well north south. And it turns out we knew it had to take a bend, but, and we actually guessed almost exactly right what happens, but it happens about out here. And we'll come back. We'll get to more of that in a little bit. Like I said, we work uh, 24 hours a day. And um, I, I don't know how many of you guys know Jim Adavazio at all, but we, um, he's notoriously a tough guy. <laughs> well, even Jim had to take the 2 a.m. to 4 a.m. shift <laughs> on occasion. So uh, it was our attempt to prove that he was human, too. And you can see I was up because my, my Texas Archaeological Research Lab hat is in the reflection there. So we move up to 2009, and now we've squished both of those machines into one lovely thing that looks like it should be in a science fiction movie. And um, this is the sub-bottom profiler. You can see the sensors mounted sideways. I have no idea why the holes are there, but apparently it, I don't know if it lets its thoughts out or what, but um, I, we're not sure that it has to look that silly, but. Um, boy, is that a lovely piece of machinery. Um, by having the side scan sonar signal and the sub-bottom profiler aligned so that we have instantly the image created by each um, right together, that means when we, when we decided to go back and dive some of our, our favorite uh, target locations, we knew what the, what the seafloor should look like when we land on the bottom, and we knew exactly where to go to find the things that were of interest to us in our, in our electronic backhoe in the sub-bottom profiler. Um, this is our, our new winch. I cannot stress enough, and I have a slide dedicated to it in a minute, um, how important a winch is in, if you want to get a towfish off the back of a boat and know where it is and send power to it and receive the signal from it. Um, Again, one of those uh, steep learning curve kind of things, getting the number of pins right and the, the right kind of uh, armored cable is tougher than you think, even in a state like Florida where there's lots of that kind of work going on. Here's a, a different er image showing a lot of the, here's the middle grounds again and um, the, the various parts of the intercontinental shelf. And you can see where in just the matter of a couple of miles, and this is our, our area three, we found what looked like a little prominent, prominent yeah. It looked like a little peninsula on the edge of what should have been a, uh, um, a lagoonal feature, probably on the order of 20, 20, 22,000 years ago. And I have better images on my laptop. It's just those individual images now, because these are massive georeference things, the small one I have is up right now is 27 megs. And the one I really would like to show you is a 130 megabyte image. And I don't really have a way to shrink it and keep the data. So. If you're interested in that sort of stuff, I'll, I'll go on for hours back at the table at the end of this day. <laughs> um, one of the other issues here, again, keeping in mind that, uh, where are we, that um, the concentration of material is between here and up into the Wakala County area where the Wakala and St. Mark's come together and flow out. Um, so what do we, knowing that that concentration of artifacts is there, what do we really expect to find? And we've... Uh, after being teased mercilessly by our colleagues as well as you know people on blogs and stuff, um, we aren't actually looking for a needle in a haystack, although we know that Paleo Indians had them and they could be out there. Um, we don't necessarily expect to even find a cache, and this is one from uh, uh, Bastrop County, just southeast of, of, of Austin, Texas, called the Hog Eye Cache. There's uh, uh, 13 Clovis points, 
and uh, 12 Clovis um, um, very late stage preforms or bifaces. So it, we're giving a paper on that in uh, St. Louis in April. So stay tuned for that if you want to hear about Clovis points per se. But the chances of finding a kill site or a small habitation site are, are, are pretty remote. We're not that optimistic. But a site like Galt, where um, it's about 45 miles uh, north and a little west of, of Austin, uh, somewhere near approaching a full 1% of the site has been dug to the Clovis level. And we have about 700,000 Clovis artifacts from excavated context, or, or from certainly known Clovis context there. Um, we're talking about 350 bifaces and preforms, uh, 50 exhausted and spent and discarded Clovis points, uh, nearly 1,000 blades and blade tools, uh, a couple hundred Clovis blade cores, uh, and, and like I said, hundreds of thousands of Clovis age uh, pieces of debitage. In total, we've got about 2 million artifacts. That we might find. And, and especially, um, which has been a little difficult to impress on people outside of Florida, is that when you find artifacts um, in the rivers or that have been in, the, you know, in a riverine or wet environment, um, because of the chemistry here, and, and re totally separate from any issues of saltwater inundation, um, they get stained jet black. So yeah, we're looking for needles sort of metaphorically, but they're stained jet black in an otherwise white background and they seem to be doing their level best to let us find them. Um, we didn't actually realize it because of course, I read a lot of literature, but I confess I didn't really get into the grouper literature before going out offshore. And it turns out steamboat lumps, we went in a diagonal up and down and stayed entirely within the marine sanctuary the whole time. And there's something really kind of funny that we didn't experience last year because we only did a couple of dives. But it turns out the preferred areas that we think would be good for finding traces of the human occupation here in the middle grounds where the, the rock sticks up, you know, 120 feet from the surrounding seafloor or where there's uh, a peninsula that's got a nice outcrop on it. Um, the places that we want to go and look are exactly where the grouper are sitting. And because grouper dig, we might actually find artifacts on the surface because of grouper, <laughs> which would probably serve us right. <laughs> Did I mention the, the winch? <laughs> um, we actually lost a day because of, a, of the pigtail. D does anybody here know what a pigtail on a winch is? Me either. Um, it's the piece that, of, of course, I have the wrong side pictured, that comes out of the middle of the coil so that while the, the winch is spinning, it, stays fr it floats free so that it doesn't spin the cable and, and pull the other end of the cable and suck our computer out through a portal. It's, it's the piece that allows it to float free. Well, if you have the wrong one or the wrong pins, um, you can lose a day of your, of your ship time trying to sort that out. So make sure you're on top of the winch if you ever try and go out doing this. Um, last year we used a small ROV that is actually a really nice little ROV called an Outland 1000 made out of some, made by some folks in Louisiana. Um, unfortunately, the 400 feet of green cable is slightly positive. Well, trying to make a little ROV go down 365 feet, which we did, and we actually got uh, a sediment sample, and we actually got video of that sample being taken because we chained the ROV to the sediment grab sampler <laughs> and gave it some scope so we could, we got it to the bottom and then were able to float, swim it around 25 feet. Um, we actually were able to get video of um, those sand ripples that I was talking about earlier in one of the side scan sonar images. Um, however, it's a sort of inelegant way of seeing the bottom compared to putting archaeological eyes on the ancient sea or the modern seafloor, but to see the, the old landscape. So we didn't take an ROV this year. We, uh, I had three of myself and two of my stu uh, two students, one at A&M, one at uh, Colorado, um, start into uh, technical diving classes. And now, right now we can go to 130 feet, and next year we'll be at least 165 feet, which means we can, it turns out that uh, the, our best guess is now, and our, our best understanding of where is the sea level during Clovis times. 130 feet is the end of Clovis time, 
and 165 feet is actually the beginning of Clovis time. And for whatever reason, it mash matches up precisely with the first and second stages of technical diving. I mean, what I mean by technical diving is, yeah, at 130 feet, we're still within recreational and um, uh, underwater academy of, of dive safety and science regulations, but uh, we're trying to dive a different way now. We're using side mount instead of doubles on the back, but, and that's in part because of some other work we want to do in Wakala eventually, but um, it's, uh, it, it's not that the learning curve is so greatly steeper on, on that as well, it's just it puts you into a new legal category as far as institutions and lawyers and dive officers are concerned. So the ability to get beyond 130 feet is, is there's a lot, of, a lot more red tape than there was just to get to that point. Um, here's actually one of the tricks that we did. You can see we're in what, uh, just about 90 meters of water here. So out near the Lake Glacial Maximum shoreline and the, the ROV is trailing the, the, this grab sample. It's like a big bear trap. So when it hits the bottom, it just grabs a little sediment off the top. Um, that wasn't doing what we wanted either. So this year we sent divers, like I said, and we managed to pound some uh, aluminum cores that I'll be uh, taking up to DC on, I gotta leave Monday. So because I can't tip over, I gotta drive them. So yeah, at the very least, I get to spend a couple days in the Smithsonian and meeting with some NOAA folks for some other things. So. We'll make it as fun and productive as possible. Um, so again, I've shown the areas on the, on the eastern edge, actually on the eastern edge of the middle grounds and farther out. We really wanted to try and focus on being in an area where we suspected we had a, we want to increase our chances of finding artifacts. Um, the farthest out we dove this year is right in this area, which is uh, just a hair under 100 miles, essentially 100 miles offshore in 130 feet of water like I said, a, an area that would have been available to uh, Clovis folks and anything that might have been in Florida before Clovis, but really nothing else after that. Um, here's a little uh, animated model of what the um, Gulf of Mexico um, gyre does. And you can see that it, it actually goes up and throws off the current that starts going straight west is just outside the middle ground. So like, again, this whole area is really well protected, not just from hurricanes, but just the normal day-to-day um, -day, um, movement of water in the Gulf in, a, in sort of a macro scale. So instead of ROVs, we, uh, we kitted up in all our gear, and this is out off the, um, on the edge of the Clovis shoreline. We actually had found, and that on the, like I said, on the bathymetric maps where th there was an intersection of two rivers, and it was at a fairly hard angle. Instead of being your normal sort of dendritic Y, it was actually a, a sort of like a T. And the three decent examples of T intersections I know of in Florida rivers, um, there's two in the Osceola, Wasissa, and um, um, at the Butler site where the Suwannee and Santa Fe come together, you get the reason they don't have the regular eroded form is because there's either dolomite or in those three examples, chert. And so on a point on the landscape that we'd identified as being only available to Clovis, potentially there, you know, there could be some wiggle room of 50 years or something. It's, it's possible we could find a Swanee occupation or Simpson or something else that we don't know of yet um, or potential pre-Clovis folks. We managed to actually land on that peninsula and I stood about 50, I actually did this on purpose. I stood up on the bottom so I could say I stood on a Clovis landscape that nobody in 13,000 years has been on. They couldn't have been on. And when I looked behind me about 15 feet away, I could actually see the river coming in from the west where there's a slight depression even in the surface. And we have decent images of this that uh, um, we'll be able to um, include in our mosaics and we'll actually have snapshots of it in, the near future. The, uh, the program you need to uh, mosaic all these things is 10 grand and they, they run clinics and every three months so if you buy the program you go see the clinic and they are so paranoid you'll send it to all your students or something like that that it comes with a dongle so only one of us at a time gets to use it so um, my map guy in Colorado gets it first and that's why I only have one map with me so um, he's in the process of mosaicing all this stuff. This is uh, uh, the Noah sent a guy with a, a very nice underwater camera and we didn't let him use the camera all the time. We actually made him dig and it was hard to find a, an action shot. He's become too much of a bureaucrat in his own opinion. So we, uh, we made him be, do some archeology span while he was out with us. Um, we, uh, 
this is actually in the middle grounds on the edge of um, what we've identified is it looks like about a 10 square mile lake that's perched on top of the, the eastern uh, ridge of the, of the Florida middle grounds. And this actually could have been fresh water, like I said, until eight, 9,000 years ago. So we had great hopes of finding archaeological remains there. There's good vertical walls. We were hoping maybe that if there's the, the, the reason that it hasn't eroded so much is that it's chert or, or dolomite or something other than just soft, porous limestone. Um, however, we came to the horrific conclusion that there's no way we're going to be able to punch through the coral mantle or the tube worm mantle with just hand tools. And even with a dredge, I think we're probably not really even going to worry about trying to punch through this at all because it could be meters thick. It, it's possible it's only a couple feet, but it turns out in the greater biological communities, I don't think anyone actually knows how thick it is. There's speculation that the entire middle grounds is a, is a bioherm, that, that they didn't even really exist 10,000, 15,000 years ago, and that the whole thing is just built up coral. Um, that would be a reasonable explanation if you couldn't see the eroded river um, features right down the middle of it. So I, I think it's a combination that, that whatever that landscape feature was that would have been available to paleo Indians and the animals running around on the Pleistocene landscape, um, I think it falls outside of the Goldilocks conundrum. I don't think we're going to be able to get at it. So we uh, abandoned all hope there and, and, and moved on. Um, and again here, trying, we, we ended up getting maybe a meter, meter 20 in just a, in a roughly 50 centimeter square hole trying to poke through it. And w one of the interesting things that probably has not much use to us as archaeologists, but um, the fact that the mantling has been characterized in all the literature as just being coral is not in fact true. And we found, we, we actually, we had about three or four different sites that where we tried this where we went down and dove on what we hoped to be uh, interesting geological features based on our side scan and sub bottom data from this year. And it turned out, however interesting they are, because they're inaccessible, we can't do a whole lot with them. But we can discuss what's happened in the Holocene and uh, how the biotic communities are actually uh, distributed radically differently than what we'd read in any of the literature uh, ahead of time trying to figure out what was going on out there. So. Unfortunately, of fairly limited um, um, archaeological utility. I, I was actually mugging for the camera doing this in about, oh, probably 60 or 80 feet of water. And you notice the anchor line, which is what we went up and down all the time. Um, I, I was just making a joke here, and that's the only reason I included it. But then I realized I actually was staying pretty horizontal. But I have a bag full of rock, a sledgehammer, a rock hammer and some other tools. You can just see the handle of the rock hammer. Uh, reels and all kinds of stuff. I probably have about 60 pounds of gear floating off my chest right there. Which is a good thing to show to your instructor for your next tech class that you can actually do this stuff and do archaeology without really putting yourself in harm's way. Um, we typically were sending down uh, dive teams of, of three people, and usually one person had either a camera or, or a video camera. So we have a lot of, of what we did documented, which when you're digging through an endless supply of tube worms or coral isn't necessarily so good. Uh, but we uh, found chert in three places, and I brought a big chunk of it. Now, it's not galt chert. It's not nice coral or anything. It's very weak, desilicified material. But it's not limestone. It really is chert. We've probably all seen artifacts made from some of this, this quality of material. Not fancy, but it's important to keep in mind that it's come from bedrock exposures on the modern seafloor. So it's really getting abused. And it's still recognizable, even in knocking it off at the surface. Um, what we did. We, we, we went perpendicular to where these guys had gone trying to trace the Swanee on its way out. And so we picked it up at about 30 kilometers and we found it in our side scan, or I'm sorry, in our sub bottom profile data, just clear as a bell. We traced it out, we hit it in nine different places. We only missed once, and I'm not too terribly ashamed to admit that the one place we missed it is because I said I thought it went, it would have gone to the south there and it didn't. It was actually still going to the west. But um, on, 
to find it in those nine spots, we only took 10 guesses. So we were really lucky and, and good or, or one or the other. I don't know. I guess <laughs> it worked out very well for us. What we did then is as we traced it as far out as we could, um, we were having trouble with the gear. And when you work in salt water, everything goes wrong. And um, for some reason, it really didn't go wrong this year. We managed to make everything work. We kept cleaning all the plugs and making everything stay alive. But we could not get over the abuse that the uh, dolphins inflicted on our towfish. At one point, there was almost 60 dolphins behind the boat. And they were on one dive where, it was only d where we only had the towfish in the water for about three hours. They stripped almost five feet of electrical tape off the cable. And w we think, I don't know, we have no idea if they were mad at it or if they r really liked it. Because they would come up to the boat. There would be three on one side, four on the other side of the back of the boat. I have no idea if we were really annoying them or not. But they seemed to be real happy with us. And they were look, you know, jumping you know, as far away as you and I are. Three dolphins. And they're obviously looking at you. So they weren't doing anything to indicate that they were angry. But they were thoroughly enamored with our towfish. And so as we got out to the southeastern edge of the middle grounds, um, the towfish died for good. And so. We packed it up, and then we dove our way back on our locations. And um, I'll skip through a couple. I have the dive photos first, unfortunately. I Sorry, I didn't think about this. Um, I have it in video. I don't have a good image of it here. We, are, uh, we, we actually get through the coral and stuff. This is actually bedrock. It's limestone. It's actually pretty solid stuff, but I don't think it would qualify as dirt in anyone's estimation. The little fish. Um, are all over the place. And what you don't see is the three of us sitting here working together in an area about this big. And there are uh, yellowjack tuna, about 20 pounders. And there's about 400 of them. Imagine 400 fish in this room. Um, it was a little disconcerting that they were either using us for cover or using us to hurdle the little fish up off the bottom. But um, we really weren't quite sure where on the food chain we were at. We, we sat at that point. but. Uh, I confess, only walking across a mountaintop in New Mexico where we walked out and came back on the trail and realized the mountain lion um, had stepped in one of our boot prints when we finally realized that, one of the, that, that we'd been stalked. I would really never felt like food while I was out doing archaeology, but I kind of did this day. <laughs> um, here's one of the other areas where we did manage to break off. It's, it's really low quality stuff, but um, when you see it, you, can, you, you, know, you know what it is. And, and again, I, I can't stress enough that we don't think it was low quality at the time. It's just that it's sitting there getting abused by seawater. And I don't think any, uh, anything is going to do very well in 13,000 years plus 10,000, 12,000 years of uh, being in salt water. Um, I just included a procedural shot of stepping off of the, the deck and giant striding into the water. And I, I just wanted to mention uh, Jessie Halogen's name. She's a student of mine, actually, at Texas A&M. And um, she's, the reason I mention her is you'll probably hear of her again. She's working in the Oscilla now, so there's a little bit of work going on in there. Her dissertation research is focusing on uh, uh, the geoarchaeological aspects of the lower Oscilla, uh, pounding some, some big sediment cores into a number of sites and really looking at the dep depositional regime and, and a lot of the environment from roughly probably the last 15, maybe 20,000 years in some parts of that. Uh, last November, we were up in the Ocilla just scouting some sites. And there's six that she's going to use. And I think I actually found uh, more mastodon digesta. So Paige Ladson, Latvis Simpson, I think we have a new one that's got uh, more of the gut contents of mastodons. So there's, there's more to come. So remember that name. Um, this was actually really interesting. And, and we're a little bit shallower here. You can see we're not in blue water anymore. We're in the sort of greenish water. We're probably in about. 70 feet of water here. So probably on a landscape that was inundated on the order of at least eight or 9,000 years ago, maybe a little bit before that. Um, it's a little hard to see, but there's a bar right here. You can see plants growing behind this chunk of the rock here. This was the second site that we dove that had chert. And by this time now, I realized as I walked around, or I swam around with my rock hammer and was hitting it, I was like, oh yeah, of course, I should hear it. And absolutely, you can tell the difference between um, just regular limestone and, and more highly silicified rock. And 
that's absolutely what we found here. What's really interesting and, and a little bit hard to tell, but you can see that there's space in front of this little bar. This bar of sand runs maybe two meters, and there's a whole series of these things that essentially there's aisles between the exposed bedrock chert and low areas that are infilled with soft sediments, sand and shell hash, and there's fine gray silts down below it. So this is one of the two sites that I think if we go to it next year with um, a dredge, and this is the other, and this is in about 55 feet of water, and that's a chunk of rock that I've knocked one big flake off. And then that's where I took the flake off, and that piece is sitting on the back table, and you're welcome to have a look at it when we're done. Um, and this is another area where the, the chert is sticking up and the, the pieces are clearly infilled. Both of this site and the previous one where I showed that bar are immediately adjacent to really well stratified sections of, of the ancient Suwannee River. Here's the piece that's sitting at the back. Um, I'm sure you've all hit something with a hammer or a shovel and it sort of made your teeth rattle. Um, hitting that stupid rock with a sledge I was intentionally keeping my mouth open and almost letting my regulator fall out of my mouth because when I was hitting it, it was ringing so loud it was making all my teeth hurt. So it doesn't look like good rock, but it sure carries a tune. Uh, here's another example. You kind of lose track of time because you don't really sleep a whole night because you either have you know the midnight to two or the six to eight or whatever ungodly shift you get. Um, you just try and catch as much sleep as you can in whatever block. And because we were alternating between diving during daylight hours and working the, the remote sensing gear from uh, dusk till dawn, um, it, unless you actually look outside, you really, lose, you really don't know what time it is or when in the world you are. The other issue that really messes that up is if anything exciting is going on, it doesn't matter when in the day or night it is. Everyone gets up and wants to see what's going on. Or like in this situation, it's, I think it's still pretty early. I don't know. I, I have no idea what time this is, <laughs> frankly. Um, but everyone's got to get up, put on the hard hats, take the lines off the back of the boat, put on the vests, and you have a whistle and a siloom. And uh, some of them had a little bottle of water in case you fall off um, that uh, they can come get you. But and, and this was, you know, pulling the winch in and out is not a one-person operation. It usually took the ship captain to control the speed of the vessel and anywhere from five to seven of us, and uh, counting the ship crew, who really enjoy what we're up to. It's really unlike any of the other stuff they've ever done. So um, we uh, have a dry lab just inside the, the back of the boat. And so this really doesn't do it justice. I think we had between seven and nine laptops and a, and a, a, a bigger computer running the, the various remote sensing gear and then trying to process some of that information on the fly in part to get a good look at it and help us decide where exactly we want to go and dive. And so here, here's what we see. This is what we stared at for uh, a great many of hours this time. Because we got our full crews and we didn't have the equipment breakdowns that we had in 2008, we actually um, surveyed 16 areas this year and in total in the, in the two years now with really 19 days of field work total or 19 and a half, say 20 days, um, we've got over 2,000 target loci and have mapped electronically um, in excess of 100 square kilometers, which is a really pretty sizable chunk. And if you think about trying to do that in 20 days, well, it really takes 24 hours a day. So we really don't let up very much, in part because it's so expensive and we get such a limited glimpse of, or a limited opportunity to, to conduct our field work that we try and really push ourselves and make as much of it as we can. Well, here's the real key to combining the side scan and the sub bottom, is they come out this should be horizontal, and I've, I flipped a nice view of it next, but a lot of times it's just flat, 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 little undulations that really are just the, the modern sand. You can see where there's maybe a layer of coral or something below it, and then there's a nice solid hard return, and that is probably a terrestrial surface. We, we don't see this everywhere. There's areas where it's just sand and there's nothing else for on the order of the, you can move the scale back and forth. These machines are designed to go thousands and thousands of feet, but that's not what's really of interest to us. We're really in the, in the top 50 feet and probably not much beyond that normally. Um, 
I can't see. Is that about, does it say 30 feet or what does it say there? I, I can't say, but well, anyway, the idea is that um, when you see a hard bottom below the modern sand and coral or whatever, um, that's what we're really focusing on and trying to find. So here's another example of just an absolutely flat, trackless nothing, just sand. It looks like there's no reason to be of interest at all, except I, I rotated this 90 degrees and made it blurry, which is wonderful. But immediately next to it, gee, guess what that is? That's one of the sites where we dove. And so, um, I actually, I'm sorry, I, I take that back. I don't believe we dove this one because if we uh, land on that, there's not a whole lot we can do about getting through this. This is actually really interesting. That's a halocline. There was saltier water, and there was also thermoclines. Um, there was uh, some really hot water down there at some points, which was really kind of interesting. I don't know if it's vents or, or an inversion or what it is, but um, when you swim through this, it, I, I'm sure most of you at some point have, been, have seen Scooby Vision, where it gets wiggly in front of you and then um, it comes back to normal. It, it really looks like it's blurry. You're swimming in water that's blurry because it's salt and fresh water or, or salt water of different um, salinity percentages sort of mixing. Well, this is one of those examples of a pretty well-defined uh, cross-section of a stream or river channel. This is actually probably, I think, I think from there to here is something on the order of 30 feet. So that's a pretty significant uh, feature on the buried landscape. And here you can see there's darker material here. For, for whatever reason, there's something there. I don't know if it's rocks. It has the potential to be bones. It's not the one I was talking about before, but it's uh, one of the nicer places we saw that right now is on a, inaccessible to us. We just can't punch through that with no matter how much I dig. I'm not going to get through that by hand. But next year, we'll go back with a dredge. And in fact, we, we're going to try and get our dredge ahead of time enough that we can go test a couple of these with a, a smaller boat and just spend two days at, a, at each of a, a, or spend a day at two different sites and see if it's really worth sitting up right there or if we need to, you know, think of uh, contingencies in case we want to go somewhere else because those are not going to pan out. Um, again, coming back to my absolutely favorite image because it shows all of this stuff. Um, because the Swanee is now known in a long stretch. We added almost 160 kilometers to that. And another thing that I, I haven't really shown or really even spoken about yet, um, we decided we wanted to see with modern gear what Ray Hole Springs look like. Ray Hole Springs is about 23 miles straight south of the modern mouth of the Oscilla. Um, uh, we called Dunbar while we were out there and we actually managed to, we, what we wanted to see was a known sinkhole that's exposed at the surface where it actually punches up and there's fresh water coming to the surface um, that's produced a couple of artifacts. There's a rumor that a Clovis point came from there and that kicks around Tallahassee. There may be, some of you guys may actually know if that's true or not or have seen it or not, but we wanted to go and actually really take a look at one of these. In the discussions by Joe Donahue and some of the other folks working out there, a guy named Rick Aneskowitz and some guys that started doing work out there in the 80s, they mentioned that they thought they found a river channel. Well, just west of there in uh, 2000, Mike Fott had a chance to, to drag some remote sensing gear from going from there down almost to past St. Pete here. Um, and he said he couldn't find it. So we basically came at a different angle of, the, of everybody and tried to hit it in cross section. And we, we've also, we mapped the Paleo Swanee, like I said, almost 160 kilometers. We mapped what essentially is going to be where the St. Mark's and the Oscilla come together for almost 50 kilometers and well, as well. And one of the reasons I mentioned that and use this image is that what we, we th because of where we were in relation to Ocklockney Shoal, it doesn't look like it's the Apalachicola. I think the Apalachicola goes to the west and south far too quickly. I think we're actually approaching that that intersection that I stood on in 130 feet of water may be, unless it's a new river and that we haven't identified yet and there's discontinuity in it and we just can't tell, but we may be looking at where the St. Mark's and Oscilla actually hit the Paleo Swanee. Something that people have speculated about for any number of years, Fought and Dunbar and Webb and a bunch of other folks back into the 60s again. 
but I think we may have actually found that. And we may be one more field season with some remote sensing gear away from actually being able to demonstrate where these rivers come together, which becomes really important when we talk about, like, I mean, if we think about how much Paleo-Indian material has come out of the Santa Fe, Itchtuckney, and, and Suwannee River system, and the Osceola, Wasissa, St. Mark's, Wakulla River system, I mean, there's a massive percentage of what is known in Florida comes from those two, two macro river systems. By adding, you know, 100 miles and, and 35, 40 miles, and, and actually having an a inkling of an idea that we're going to put 100 miles on the Osceola system as well, um, it really opens up what we can say about how that landscape um, is either got um, impediments to movement of plants and animals and people or conduits of movement for, for, the, for them as well. And so it's not entirely terra incognita anymore, but we're still working on the artifacts or finding sites with artifacts. Um, here's a, a, a sort of a, a, de a more, a better graphic example of why I think we're in the right area of, in terms of trying to find potential sites is that we're, you know, we're working in the area from here through here. You can see the, the, the light red in uh, Collier County is the only county that only had mammoth and not mastodon. All the others had uh, both or, or have remains of both that have been reported. If you know any that I missed that you know of examples of mammoth or mastodon in either of those. Um, we, like I said, we have to punch through that bio mantle and get through the worms or the silt or the, or the coral, but we think the site should look a lot like this. <laughs> and here's the, the Clovis distribution, and I put an asterisk on this because I got a real nice call from Jim Dunbar last week, and I'm not sure if I'm, he won't tell, it's easier to tell him I should, or get yelled at if I didn't. Um, I'm sure you guys know how the laws have changed since the Atosha that treasure salvers every year meet with the state of Florida and anything that's thought to be of really great importance to all the people of Florida, um, the state gets essentially right of, I, I believe, right of first refusal or they get their pick of the, the stuff. Well, somebody found a Clovis point offshore this year, um, a little south of Fort Pierce on the Atlantic side. So it's about the farthest south um, on the Atlantic seaboard and it was over 15 centimeters long. So it's the biggest, the farthest south, and uh, unusual outside of a cache. So I don't know, there's probably a site out there that we want to go look at now too. <laughs> so that's why I put my asterisks on there. But again, you see the idea of that I've probably bulldogged into the ground now. I confess, this is really not, when I made these images, I really wasn't thinking of Florida people because mostly we kind of get it. Certainly within the archaeological community, everyone understands that there's concentrations of stuff and where they are, but how much of it is uh, not always easily impressed on other folks around the rest of the country. So there's the, uh, that's the, the Galt School of Archaeological Research in Austin, which we were at UT, but now I'm still affiliated with them, but it's more of a, it's moving to Texas State. So Galt is on hiatus, but it actually, um, uh, Mike Collins is now actually a research professor at Texas State as of about a week ago. So Galt will be back, and we'll let you know when we find the next Galt out offshore. We're, I think we're at the point where we've identified the haystacks. We know where the needle case is now, because that's where the, you know, the rock is, and now it's a matter of sitting down with a dredge for a few days, and we should find the right, we, 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 I, I think in two days I'll find artifacts. So I'll, uh, Call, come back when I got those. Okay, thank you, thanks. I, I know I glossed over lots and lots of things, so despite having 50 slides, I know there's something I didn't cover. So, I mean, I'm happy to talk about any of this stuff. With, with there, are, there are a couple of real interesting things, though, that you're, you're, uh, you bring to mind for me for when I made those maps of Florida for the distribution of the mammoth and mastodon and the Clovis points, I actually did them for uh, from Colombia and Venezuela all the way north, the known Clovis distribution. There's actually a site in, there's a series of sites in Venezuela straight south of Aruba on a little peninsula 
at a series of sites, this guy George Pearson has found 300 preforms and about 50 Clovis points. And I don't mean they're fluted points and we don't know. It's absolutely Clovis stuff. You could, if you painted them the right color, they would blend in at Galt or any other Clovis site. So um, from, there's a good distribution of folks that we recognize with, with continuity in their behavior by 13,000 years. So it's entirely possible that people are making this hop, you know, this is the shortest gap at, you know, at 20,000, 22,000 years old ago. And it's obviously going to get longer as we get closer to when we know we have people. At 15,000 years ago, that gap becomes pretty big. It may, that, that gap may be more apparent than real in a human sense because what you're looking at is something that's, as a, I, I don't want to stand up here and suggest 26,000 years ago is the occupation in this part of the new world. But, it's possible, but I just I think we don't have any we don't have much or any good evidence for that. Um, there's a couple of interesting things biologically. Uh, since we got out of the field, some folks in the paleo working for Bruce McFadden, some grad students contacted me and wanted to know how much of the uh, paleo swanee we'd found because they've identified a Pleistocene turtle that seems to, the species is specific to the swanee. So in terms of, like I said, a conduit to movement, I think we actually can already t point to a concrete example in our research area where here's an animal that only exists in the Swanee. And oh, by the way, since we added 100 miles to that, they can actually talk about some different aspects of the biogeography of that animal. It turns out there's actually, um, for, for me, my interest working for Webb all through grad school and big mammals, um, some of the other elephants, the Gomphotheres and the uh, Cuvionius and these, uh, a couple of other weirded ones that are really rare are, are concentrated, the fossil examples, in um, Central America and on the southern parts of Mexico. And it turns out that for the species other than my mammoth and mastodon, they're all found at 10 meters of elevation or lower. And there's some discussion in, based on the isotopic signatures, the biology of those individual animals, that they in fact did not go into the areas, they avoided the areas that the, they were inhabited by mammoth and mastodon. So we may find that out on this continental shelf, in the low-lying areas that were preferred by Cuvionius and, and uh, the other one that's escaping me right now, um, that the, the um, resource adaptation inside of the coast by these early peoples may actually be completely different because of the different species being utilized. Or just even if they're big game hunters or even if they're focusing on elephants, um, it's going to be radically different than what we see at Clovis or Lubbock or Dent or any of the other big mammoth kill sites. It's just one of those interesting things that cropped up trying to you know, piece together what should we expect to find out there. There's ways around things. We're sort of trying to do this essentially on a shoestring because right. we just, uh, I'm just getting into being a technical diver um, and I've got two of my students at, at my level as, the, as tech one divers. Um, there are people that can go and do these kind of things. Mixed gas divers, folks can go to you know thousand feet and hard helmets if they want to. But um, in terms of getting us as archeologists that can conduct the right kind of investigations, the right kind of excavation protocol and stuff like that. Um, we're getting there. We had nine minutes at 130 feet this year. Um, we are trained to have had 100, uh, half an hour without a decompression stop by switching tanks. We're, we have four, we're trained with four tanks strapped to our chest. And uh, we should have been able to stay a half an hour, but the uh, folks we had to answer to didn't feel we were uh, and, and there's, I, I can't really argue their point, but it really puts a crimp in my research design um, that we don't have enough experience at those depths doing this kind of stuff, but it's a catch-22, so now we got a bunch more experience. So next year, I suspect, they don't have legitimate worries or, or certainly not a good reason to prevent us from going and being able to dive at those. Yeah, I, was, I, I mean, at that <coughs> point, I wasn't even thinking about it. The amount of time that you could spend down there, I was just one, I was just thinking about uh, exposing large enough areas at that depth uh, when you've got to dredge out. What did you say? Ten meters of well, water. yeah, on, on one it was yeah. ten. We probably wouldn't try and go to that. We would go to the ones where the rock comes right up to the surface, and we're going to cut, you know, try and get into a crack. Um, 
part of my problem is we're, we'll be a little bit hamstrung, and this is why I'm actually going to, I'm, I have to drive our cores to DC and hand them off to Autovasio while we're going to meet with the NOAA folks. Um, when I pick up my phone, I'll know if I'm going Monday or going Tuesday. <laughs> um, we're talking to them about, we're, we're being funded through the Office of Exploration, and they're serious about the explora exploratory part of it. Um, we jokingly refer to ourselves as the RSN, which is the Royal Salutrian Navy, and, and tease Dennis Stanford and Bruce Bradley mercilessly about it. Um, so we couldn't, we made up researching the submerged new world as our, as our project name. And we couldn't use that name because it was researching. We, have to, we changed it to exploring the submerged new world. So, uh, uh, the dredge is an exploratory tool just to poke through it, but really what we're going to talk to the NOAA folks about now is moving out of that project and moving into their, um, it's so hard to get boat time and it eats up so much of our budget, it's, it's almost half, uh, actually this year was almost 60% of our budget was just to be there. Um, if we can get over that hurdle, NOAA's got some great boats. They've got um, the Thomas Jefferson to be a wonderful boat to, uh, it's even got a, it's, it's their diving boat, and it's almost 200 feet long. We could just sit out there and do excavation for weeks if we wanted to on these sites. So as soon as we find artifacts out there, uh, the doors open up for us. It's basically what we've been told, what we've heard from folks at the NSF, is that everyone's sort of waiting with bated breath. I, I read, um, I didn't realize we had a press release come out on September 1st until uh, two days ago, and so I searched the headline, and I got 43,000 hits. And, and I admit, I can't, I, I love reading the blog comments just to see what they're saying about us. And somebody, one of the first comments was, oh dear God, don't let them find Salutrian. <laughs> <laughs> Which I'm dying to tell Dennis when I see him next week. When people and animals are out on this landscape, there are a set of parallel ridges. And when you look at the bathymetric maps, and uh, a guy here at USF, uh, Dave Narr, and there's a bunch of guys doing a lot of really interesting remote sensing stuff. Uh, Stan Locker, and there's, there's a half dozen of them who we've come in contact with in the couple years we've been coming down here. Um, they've they've multi-beamed, which is similar to side scan sonar, but doesn't really do things the way we would need to see them. They've multi-beamed the entire middle grounds and gone over it and created nice images of the whole topography. It really looks like, I mean, you can see point bars in their <laughs> data. You can see that this stuff has been eroded. There was a river running through it, so it's some, it, it, these features existed on that Pleistocene landscape and survived after that, after inundation of all the land around them. When that ended, I don't know, I, I went at it with a hammer and tongs, and I have not got through the tube worms or the coral yet. <laughs> but yeah, I, th I think they were exposed it, possibly as much as 8,000 years ago. And we were actually diving, like I said, in an area where it looks like a lake. Um, we jokingly referred it, we call it the Eye of Osiris site because it looks like a big eye, sort of like a big Egyptian eye. I have an uh, image on, on screen if I, I push my laptop to get off the snoozing right now. I can show you, but I think that's actually the place where we would expect to find the most archaeological material. But uh, uh, getting back to your question for a second, Bob, that area may be impossible to get to right now. I mean, I shouldn't say impossible. Um, some folks are actually dynamiting stuff. You can, you can use really big coring rigs, but you readily, I mean, our, our budget last year was 100,000, this year was 120. Um, you're instantly talking about the ship time for five or 10 days is $100,000. And you're gonna essentially destroy the site to find you know, what's there. And, I can't do that. <laughs> so if they're doing it and they find artifacts and, and we hear about them, that would be great. But I would r instantly discourage them from doing those kind of things. So, oh, that, that's something I should mention. Um, in just trying to pull this kind of a project together to get the right kind of gear, because I like the Klein stuff, but there's all kinds of different material or uh, different tools you can use, so side scan, sub bottoms, combined systems, different ways of doing things. Just talking to vendors and people who've been involved in this kind of work, not archaeologically, we found out about uh, the Mel Fisher guys found uh, 8,400 year old uh, pine tree off the off of Key West. Um, there's forests, intact fields of stump stumps off the coast of Alabama, North Carolina, Virginia, and Maryland. 
and maybe Maine and British Columbia, and there's a forest in Lake Michigan. So there's really interesting things out there, clear landscape features that I'd love to, you know, if I want to excavate, I can date that landscape and I can punch right through it and excavate the terrestrial sediments immediately below it. So there's massive amounts of anecdotal information that's been accumulated of, as people have dredged things up for the better part of 200 years. But we're just getting to where uh, we're, I'm sort of becoming a focal point for people emailing me all the time, just out of the blue. Oh, I found this, and you ought to look here. And it's down to about one in tens. Uh, oh, you're an idiot. <laughs> We're trying to sort of hedge our bets in that respect by staying, like I said, we moved in this year to within areas that would have been 13,000 and younger. Uh, the, the, there's the potential for occupations. Excuse me. I don't think we, we worked anywhere, oh, maybe as new as 6,000 years ago as we were, you know, looking in the real, narrow, or in the real shallow ends of the, the sunk Swanee Channel. Um, but again I, where I showed the image of the side scan and sub bottom together what we were really keen on is what what we saw in that early in my second where I showed Dunbar's distribution of Paleo Indian finds and they're really key to uh, available freshwater and chert where you find chert and water together that's where you find the paleo sites the, the water available to them then so that's why we're finding where we find rock or we're, we're going to where we see rock sticking up in the si side scan sonar that we think is bedrock and not just coral or worms or whatever, immediately adjacent to the buried river channel. And in those three places where we actually found chert, I think that's one of those situations where it, it may well be paleontological. It may be that we, we have a, a site that's got deposition of interesting things from you know, the terminal Pleistocene 10,000, 11,000 years ago, all the way back to 40,000 years ago. I, I could live with finding a site like that. That would be OK. <laughs> Um, Exxon used to be really big in it, and Exxon, uh, Vice President of Exxon actually supports the Galt School, and they're very interested in what we're doing. Um, I think it's, we're a real double-edged sword for them. Uh, I, I actually spent some real effort looking into this with the minerals management and stuff. We're in the northeast quadrant. Um, the, the Gulf of Mexico is cracked into three slices, about here. Uh, actually, it's, I think it's to Mobile than one that's basically from Mobile to the Texas border and then Texas. In Louisiana offshore, there are three, 5,000 active permits from the Louisiana border to the Mexico border. There's a couple thousand. From Mobile East, there's 280. From the area around the middle grounds in our research area, if you were really grand about that, there's a grand total of one active uh, oil and gas lease. It's not there. They don't care. They're not looking there. It's because there's so many marine sanctuaries in that area. Even if they find it, it's going to be a pain in the butt. There's a big pipeline. The Buccaneer pipeline runs just outside of all of this. I mean, just outside of the areas we've been looking. Um, uh, frankly, if we start finding archaeological sites all over there, it's probably cheaper for them to kill me than it is to fund my <laughs> research. <laughs> and, and I only say that half tongue in cheek just because we would represent a tremendous amount of expenditure on their part to become compliant with cultural resource management. But boy, it'd be a growth industry for us. <laughs> so um, I think our next step if we find artifacts, especially at, at two of the three sites that had shirt, I really think if I get a day with a dredge at the two of them, um, I think I'm going to have artifacts. I, I feel pretty confident about that. If we get to that point, I think we'll be overwhelmed with how many friends we have. <laughs> and, and we do have an in with, with uh, ExxonMobil, for, for an example. I, I've heard of flakes and, and, and a lot of bones, which are of interest to us, but they don't quite make the mark for what we're, what we're going after. But um, I've heard rumors, but I have nothing confirmed. The other things I was talking about, like a forest off Alabama or a field of stumps and stuff like that, I've got much better provenience and information about them in general. But uh, a lot of rumors and whispers, but uh, I don't know. They keep running into shipwrecks, which is a real problem for them, and means they actually have to go ahead and excavate these things. Um, uh, somebody here in the 50s did that. It was. Goggin or, um, doggone it, somebody on the west coast, not far from here, dug a shipwreck 
and came down on an archaic site below the shipwreck. And I can't remember for the life of me who it is. The, the really killer example of this is off the coast of uh, South, Af South Africa, I think just south of Madagascar. Um, Nick Fleming had an article about this a couple years ago. Uh, these guys dug a 17th century Dutch ship, beautiful shipwreck, sitting in the cells. And I don't know if it was inexperience or stupidity or what, but they went right on through the shipwreck, um, hit an inundated landscape, and sucked up two Ashleyan hand axes, somewhere between 1.2 and 1.7 million years old. So to think that it's a big deal that we might have 12 or ooh, 15, 20,000 year old artifacts preserved in situ out there, well, let me tell you what the really old ones are. It's in, well in excess of a million years. And if you guys, I don't know if anyone follows this um, at all, but the really interesting things that keep cropping up in the North Sea, um, the British have a really good uh, setup where the gravel miners have people watching all the time for artifacts and um, faunal, faunal remains. So they're not missing much now. I mean, they're disturbing the context, but uh, the, the latest thing, there's been a Neanderthal uh, fragment of Neanderthal bone, and one of my favorites was uh, a giant cat thought to have been extinct 300,000 years ago. They found a 20,000, 28,000-year-old piece of bone. So again, like I was mentioning before, talking about changes in our understanding of, of the biology of these animals and where they are on the landscape and what their presence or absence would mean in terms of human adaptations becomes, we get more and more information every time we go out there and it turns out there's people all over the world finding really interesting stuff. Like I mentioned earlier that we, we'd seen a couple places where there's like 17, 18 layers of distinct strata and stuff. Um, a couple of those look like they're actually in sinkholes. And that's where we would expect to find good context is that the stuff was buried in freshwater and fluvial sediments or, or, or whether it's a river or a sinkhole, you know, just slow water stuff um, before the, sh the sand and shell and coral and whatnot starts accumulating on top of it. That it's, re it's recessed in a hole anyway in a fairly low energy regime area that's fairly well protected. So I, I could kind of Lego together the uh, Goldilocks argument a little bit longer and it's actually not just a couple reasons but there's five or six reasons that seem to play together that that if we get into one of these sinkholes in the right kind of a area where it was appealing to people that the preservation should in fact still be there.